In the last uh, few weeks, uh, Pastor Travis has been speaking on guardrails, and then last week, Pastor Jacques actually ministered to us on guardrails regarding sexuality. And unfortunately, it kind of looks like uh, I- I'm kind of going that way again this morning. You know, it's one of those things, it's, I kind of have this sense, sometimes when, you're, when you, you have a message the Lord's giving to you, i got to hold this mic up. Uh, I caught that before you even told me, actually, so I'm getting better here. Um, but sometimes when, when the Lord's speaking to you, giving you a message, it's kind of like there's aspects of it you don't really want to share, you don't really want to say. But, you know, we all need repetition, don't we? And I have three little boys, and I couldn't tell you how many times that I've had to repeat things to them. You know, Anita and I both, just you have to say it over and over and over again. And not necessarily because they don't get it, not necessarily because you and I don't get it, but just because we need to hear it again. Sometimes it's just something we need in the moment, you know, so thank God for for that. And I was thinking when um, Pastor Jacques, wow, this thing seems a little topsy-turvy here. But, um, I was thinking when Pastor Jacques was sharing last week on our need to have guardrails regarding just sexuality. And, you know, all, all these principles, whenever God lays out a principle... And you might be sitting here saying, well, that's not really my thing. That's not really my issue. But, you know, you can take the same principle and apply it to any area in your life. It could be a financial situation. It could just be another thing that's going on in a relationship in general. But we can always take the principles that God's giving to us and and apply them in other things. And I was thinking when Pastor Jacques was talking last week um, on these guardrails for sexuality, you know, isn't it amazing how the devil does everything he can to get people involved intimately, sexually, before they're married. And then after you're married, everything he can to separate that, to, to shut that thing down. Isn't that amazing how the devil does that? Right? Because he, he's always trying to get you to do something at a time, something out of, out of God's place and out of God's blessing. But, you know, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. And you know, something along that lines too that, that the Lord spoke to me and I, I've learned too over the course of my life is, is something you've done out of time in the, in the situation, if it was getting involved uh, intimately with somebody before you were married, that isn't sanctified when you end up marrying that person. It's only sanctified when we repent of it. Because God's not, he's not sanctifying just a situation, he's sanctifying you and me. And that, that comes with repentance, right? We, we can't sanctify something that was wrong. And when, if it was wrong back there, it was wrong back there. And it doesn't get right by getting married. And yeah, you know, in lots of situations, it's a good thing that those people come to that place where they say, hey, yeah, I want to make that commitment. You know, I, I want to do what's right in God's eyes. So, you know, praise God for that, you know. And we've all been there in different situations. And it wasn't a marriage situation in your life. It, it's still a situation where God wanted us to, to make it right, Amen. you know. And, but that comes through repentance. We still have to repent of what was back there. Um, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25, and Brian's got that for us there, uh, it says, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. God doesn't want you and me just to live. He also wants us to walk. Right? So we want to live and walk. And I don't know if Brian was able to pull that off. So this is the law. Amen? Live and walk. So just remember that. That's the law of the Spirit now right, is to live and to walk in the Spirit. And it's so easy for us, you know, when, when we come in as believers in your life and to kind of want to stay in the place that we were, you know, whether you're just new, a born-again Christian and, and just seeking to know and understand the ways of God um, or, or you're further along in your maturity, but we, we always have this tendency to want to stay where we are. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to just live. We want to walk in the Spirit. God wants us to live and walk in the Spirit. Uh, Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 7 says, Like the legs of a lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. So, you know, somebody that's born has legs, right? 
We're all born with legs. And, but the thing is, is that God doesn't, God wants us to use those legs. So when we're birthed into the kingdom, when we're birthed into the things of God, God wants us to learn how to walk. And there's only two reasons that I know of why a person would be walking. And one is you're new in the Lord and, and you haven't learned to walk yet, right? There's a period of time that we go through where we're learning to walk. We're learning to, to get our balance and to stand up. And the only other reason aside from that is that we were walking and for some reason we got wounded, we got hurt. And thus we have, you know, the legs of a lame man that hang limp. And so, and that happens in our life too, doesn't it? Sometimes as a believer, you're going along in your life and something happens and, and you get wounded. You get hurt. And then you stop walking. But God doesn't want that. He wants us to live and walk in the Spirit. And we're going to be looking at... Uh, I want us to look for a little bit here at Samson's life. And, uh, you know, Samson was a really interesting character for any of you who are kind of somewhat familiar with his life story. And uh, in Hebrews, I want to start in Hebrews, actually, uh, 11.32, <clears throat> it says, And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. And we've got the next verse there, uh, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of aliens. And so Samson, we find here, he's mentioned in what you know we often refer to as um, God's faith hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11. Samson's mentioned here. But we're going to take a little closer look at um, Samson's life, because Samson, you know, as we, as we read there, he, he actually was somebody who stopped the mouths of lions. We're going to see there was, a, there was a lion that all of a sudden came out of him, and it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he tore the lion apart. Um, <clears throat> he subdued kingdoms. You know, he started to attack and, and overthrow the Philistines, who at that time were um, oppressing Israel. And uh, he also... He was made uh, strong out of weak, and that was his great anointing that Samson carried, was the incredible ability to do things with strength. And uh, there's a time at the end of the life where he was weak, when he shouldn't have been weakened. But out of that time, he was made strong when he called upon the Lord, and the Lord gave him another great uh, victory over his enemies. So I want to turn to uh, Judges chapter 14. Chapter 14, I'm going to start in verse 3. So, maybe just a little background here. Samson, um, his mother and father hadn't had any children at all at this point. His, his mother was barren, and so the angel of the Lord comes to her and tells her that she's going to have a child and that she's not to drink any wine, she's not to... Um, partake of anything that's of the vine, in fact, uh, and she's, she's just consecrating herself. And that was the same consecration that Samson was to carry through his life. He was not to touch anything, and if you go back and look in Numbers chapter 6, it gives all the details of what we <clears throat> know as the Nazarite vow, right? And he was, so Samson wasn't to cut his hair, um, and he was not to, to drink anything either. He wasn't to touch anything. If you had this vow, you weren't supposed to touch anything that was dead. Uh, or else you were defiled, and then you had to go back and do a cleansing and, and make that right. So we find here in chapter 3, um, Samson, you know, he's, we don't know how old he is, but anyways, he's old enough that he's looking for women now. And so he comes along here, um, and he says to his mother and father, um, he says, look, I've, I've saw this woman um, who's of the Philistines, and he says, I want you to get her for me. And, and they say, listen, can't you go to, you know, among the daughters of your own people and find somebody to marry? It's like, you know, you would encourage your children to seek after a believer, right? You would want them to find a believer, not somebody who's outside the church, not somebody who doesn't have a, a heart or desire for God. So his parents are saying, look, like, no, look here. But Samson said to his father, he says, get her for me, for she pleases me well. 
And literally in the Hebrew, that actually means, for she is right in my eyes. Wow. You know, how many times have you and I got into trouble because it was right in our eyes? And, you know, there's a proverb. Um, I don't know if I gave that to you um, <clears throat> there, Brian, but Proverbs chapter uh, 14, verse 12, that says... Um, Did, you, did, you, did I give that one to you, Brian? Okay, great. Save me. Look it up. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And, you know, ultimately that's what happened to Samson, right? In the end, he, he kept doing what was right in his eyes, and he, he ended up dying. And I think he died prematurely. I really think God had much more for Samson to do. But because of the way he walked out his life, um, that was cut short. But in spite of all that, one of his first downfalls is he's doing what's right in his own eyes. Then in verse 4, uh, we find in, uh, back to Judges chapter 14 again. It says, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at the time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And um, we find, you know, in the same way, the Lord, he wants to confront enemies in your life and my life. And sometimes in spite of us making choices that aren't the best, um, the Lord can still confront things in our life. And I remember a time in my life where, um, and and this wasn't in a negative situation, this particular instance, but um, I was seeking to try, and this friend of mine introduced me to this girl, and... And so anyways, we, we kind of got to know each other a bit, and then I asked her out, you know, if she wanted to go out again, and she said no, and she was a teacher, so, um, you know, she said, well, I got to mark all these papers, I don't have time, and then I asked her again some other time, and she was, so after a while, you know, I started feeling the cold shoulder. So I was going to ask her again, but I didn't want to, but I just felt that I was supposed to, and so I did, and sure enough, it was... It was the cold shoulder again. So at that point, I just, I backed off. I knew it wasn't happening, right? But anyways, I say all that to simply say that I just, I had this sense when, when that last time I just didn't want to go there again, I really felt the Lord prompted me, just ask her again, because the Lord wanted to confront a fear in my life, a fear of rejection. And, and that's all it was. It was just like, once I did that, once I asked her again, it's like, I felt a, a peace about you know, okay, I don't need to pursue this relationship anymore. It's just not of God. It's not going where it's supposed to, and uh, or where it's maybe not supposed to go. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so it was just a confrontation of the enemy in my life, that enemy of fear. And likewise, there was, a, there was another time in my life where the Lord had just kind of downloaded this new revelation to me. And I was sharing... Uh, at the time, I was working for um, another farmer who lived next door to us, and I worked for him one summer. And a great guy. And at the time in my life, he was like a father in the spirit to me. But he had his shortcomings too, like we all do. And uh, and sometimes he 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 would just pick at certain things. And so when I got this new revelation, I really didn't want to share it with him because I just had this sense that while well, he's He's just going to tear it all apart. But I really thought, I really had this sense from the Lord that, look, I want you to just tell him this truth. Tell him this thing that you've learned uh, from me anyways. Because I want to know if you're willing to stand up for what you believe. I want to know if you're willing to defend the truth even when other people don't believe what you're presenting. And so, you know, again, it's just, it's just the Lord does these things in our life to help us to confront those enemies that are in our life because he he does he wants to confront the enemies and the things that are coming at us trying to make us less than what god intended us for us to be so moving on with uh samson here in verse six uh so this lion charges at him And it says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn a young goat. 
who had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. And then verse 9. still find it there. There we go. Um, no, that's Proverbs 14.9. I'll get it here for you. Judges 14.9 says, um, so anyways, Samson comes back and, and this lion that was dead, he, the carcass was there along the road for a while. So when he's passing by, however long, a number of days or a few weeks later, he stops by to look at this lion. He, he finds out that the bees have made a nest in there, and, and there's honey in there. So he scoops them up and takes it. And then he goes and he gives some to his uh, parents. And it says um, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he'd taken it, the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So here's a couple times where Samson isn't revealing to his parents what he's doing. And the reason is, is because when we go back again, if you look, and I don't want to go there, but in Numbers chapter 6, it talks about all the things for the Nazarite, how he used to keep himself pure. And one of them was not to touch something that was dead. And so twice now, he's, you know, he's killed a lion. Now he's gone back, taking the honey out, and he's also given it to his parents. And so he's, he's breaking this vow, this vow of purity that he's supposed to have, the separation of his life to the Lord. And he's broken that. So he's hiding it. You know, and, and we do that in our lives sometimes too, don't we? We know things aren't really quite white. We're not, we're not doing what we should be doing. And, and so instead of coming out and confessing it and going back and making it right, we just try to hide it. Uh, and then in verse 17, so, so now here in verse 17, Samson... Uh, has gone down to this woman that was right in his eyes, and they're in the midst of a, a wedding feast, and he, he tells this riddle to the rest of the Philistine community, and they have to solve his riddle or else they owe him like 30, 30 garments, 30 new garments, right? So he's looking for some material blessing out of this. And anyway, so his wife-to-be, she starts weeping on him and saying, listen, tell me that what the riddle is. Tell me what the solving of it is. And, of course, the other Philistines have come to his wife-to-be to ask her to find out what it is, find out what the solution to the riddle is, because otherwise then they're going to owe all this. And so, so they've, they've basically threatened her in order to have her to do this. So she's weeping on him. And um, it says at the end that it says he told her what it was because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. And what we find here is, is just this wearing down that goes on in, in Samson's life. And in, and in part because he's done something that he shouldn't have done. And... And we find this later on, too, and we're going to see it again, where Samson gets worn out. You know, there's times where it says he's vexed, his soul is vexed, you know, because of the wearing down. And we all have that at times in our life, that experience in our life. But God doesn't, he really wants to teach us how to overcome that and not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of the enemy when we're worn down and, uh, and worn out. And uh, just kind of a, a funny note on that aspect. Um, and actually, I didn't get an angel visitation to keep me from this one, but Travis and I and Anita and Camilla, we were coming back from a conference a few months ago. And uh, it was late at night, and uh, I don't know how tired they were, but I was tired, and I had a bit of a splitting headache. So I was, I was worn out. So we're sitting in this restaurant. We're, we're done eating, and I say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to the washroom. i got to relieve myself. So I, I go to the, to the bathroom, and I open the door, and I come in, and I think, well, there's no urinals in here. That's kind of weird. So that should have been my first clue. So anyways, I, I find a stall, and I go in and sit down and do my business. And as I'm sitting there, I hear these women start chattering away. <laughs> And I think, oh, no, I didn't do this. I didn't go into the women's bathroom. So, 
Anyways, I wait for the chattering to stop, and they went outside. And I heard somebody else over there, but as soon as they got out and I was done, I went right out. I didn't even wash my hands. I just shot right over <laughs> to the men's bathroom to do the washing up. But anyways, these are things that happen when you're worn out. But that's a funny one, maybe. But the thing is, is, you know, really bad stuff happens when we get worn out. You know, the enemy tries to, to take advantage of us. I'm not going to tell the other story, Travis. <laughs> that happened to me again. It was actually even worse than that one. Oh, you got you in suspense? All right, I'll tell it. So this was when Anita and I went to uh, the Caring for the Heart uh, training seminar. That was about a month after that one or something like that. And um, so we went to this training and... Travis had set up for us to stay in the house of this lady, and uh, an older lady, praise God, and uh, <laughs> for my sake. <laughs> and anyways, so we're there, and so our, our bedroom is upstairs, and I thought that her bedroom was downstairs. And so I went up, and we were getting ready for the night and getting ready for bed. And, you know, I'm stripped down. I'm butt naked. And I didn't bother shutting the door to my bedroom because I'm thinking, well, her bedroom's downstairs, so it doesn't matter, and I can just pop out to the bathroom, right? Anyway, so I'm butt naked, and I'm like this. And as I turn around, her bedroom door across the hall is just closing. <laughs> and I think, she must have saw me. I'm sure she saw me. <laughs> Anyways. The only thankful part of that for me was that it wasn't a face-to-face encounter, so. <laughs> Anyways, don't let yourself, well, I was going to say, don't let yourself get worn out, but we all get worn out, but we got we to gotta deal with this stuff. Okay, so <laughs> back, to, back to Samson, back to Samson. Um, so, in, again, in Judges chapter 14 and verse 19, um, Samson, after this whole incident with his wife uh, pressing him and the Philistines figure out the riddle, he, he's upset, and we see at the end of this verse, so his anger was aroused, and he went back to his father's house. And uh, in the meantime, he catches all these foxes, ties their tails together, uh, sets the Philistines' fields on fire because he lights a fire on their tails and lets them run off running through their wheat and barley fields and everything. And so his wife ends up being given to another. So then as a result of that, then he gets angry again. And um, he attacks the, the Philistines and kills a number of them. It doesn't say in that particular instance how many. Then in chapter 15 and verses 6 to 8. Said, then the Philistine said, who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he's taken his wife and given him to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he did. He, he went out and fought against them and killed a whole bunch of them. And yet, the reason I'm, I'm kind of pointing out some of this is because Again, we come back to this reality that God wanted a reason. He wanted to confront the Philistines. And so he's using it, even though there's a lot of garbage and junk in, in Samson's life. He, he uses that to confront the Philistines. Um, and, and you can see why, because, you know, they come up and they, they burn one of their own people, because uh, his wife-to-be was of the Philistines. They, they go to burn her and her father and her family with fire. And, and you see this um, characteristic coming out of the Philistines about how they, they work with people, right? Not, not something we would really consider appropriate <laughs> in our day, right? Going out and burning people and threatening them. And we see these things coming forth in the Philistines. So you can see why God wants to come against the Philistines. Because these are the people that are oppressing and ruling over Israel. And he wants to set them free from a people like that who would rule over them. And you know, the devil's the same way in your life, my life. Right? He, he, he'll come again. He'll threaten you. He'll come against you with all kinds of stuff like that because he wants to rule over you because he wants to keep you down because he doesn't want you to live and walk 
He might let you live, but he doesn't want you to live and walk. Okay? So we want to keep the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit is to live and walk. Amen. So, so this goes on. This is why God wants to confront the Philistines. Then in 16 in verse 1, it says, Now Samson went to Gaza, and he saw a harlot there, and he went into her. So, you know, now, now he, he sees this harlot, and so he goes into her. And, you know, it's just like uh, in Proverbs chapter 7, where it talks about how Solomon, you know, writing that proverb, he said, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw a young man who was lacking understanding, and he went down to the corner near her house. He went down to the place where the harlot hung out. And that's what Samson does. You know, he goes, he gets into these places again where he shouldn't be. And then in verse 4, it says, Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sark. So he's done with the harlot now. Now he's moved on to another woman. This is the third woman in his life now. And he says he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now, maybe that should have gave it away for him right there, Delilah, because uh, she, she had some serious issues in her life. But um, it was his own undoing. So, uh, and the word Delilah, actually, her name actually means temptress or tease, you know? So that was, that was the meaning. That's... You know, often you find behind names and that in the scripture God gives them because they're revealing the character of the person. They're saying something about that person's character. And that was the character that uh, we find unfold with Delilah. And, you know, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26 says that, um, that a harlot will reduce you to a crust of bread because all you are to them is payment. That's all you are to them is payment. It's, it's not about a real life-giving relationship. And so, um, so he, he, he ends up uh, falling in love with Delilah. And then in verse 5, Judges 14 and 5 again, it said, The lords of the Philistines came up to her, so that's Delilah, and said to her, Entice him. Find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So here we are, the Philistines again, right? This is their character. They come up and, and they're bribing her to find out where his great strength lies. And because they're trying to find out What's Samson's source? You know, what's, what's his source? You know, what's, what's there? And, you know, it reminded me of uh, <clears throat> a number of years ago, I saw this uh, movie in the IMAX in Ottawa. It was called The Fires of Quaid. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, it's an awesome movie. And I think you can probably just catch it on YouTube now. But anyways, um, The Fires of Kuwait were back in 1991, I believe it was, when Saddam Hussein uh, came into Kuwait and he set all these oil wells on fire, and there was like, there's like six, seven hundred of them that he set on fire, and so the smoke is, you know, it's just billowing up. And, anyways, I'd love to tell you part of the story, <clears throat> whole thing, but anyways, uh, the gist of the story is, is they figured they're going to be years trying to clean this up, and I think in the end it only took them like ten months or eleven months or something. And what happened was all the different countries rallied together, and they all had different methods, but they came in, and the basic method that a lot of them used was, like this one was, the, this one country created this big machine, had this huge water power, and it's not that you could douse the fi- fire. They weren't trying to douse the fire because it was just, it was just too much. But what they, what they wanted to do was they wanted to, with the, the water pressure, they wanted to just separate that flame from the oil source. Because if they could just, just eat, it only took like, if they could just separate for about a second or two, that was enough to put the fire out, and then they could go in and cap the well. 
And of course, they're, they're dealing with intense heat to even get close enough to do all that. But all they wanted to do was just separate that flame for a minute from the source. And you know, it's the same way that the enemy tries to work in our life. He just, he just wants to come in. He's looking for an opportune time to separate you from your source. So separate you from the Spirit of God, from that communion that you have with the Spirit of God. Um, and um, I think at this point, I just want to jump to uh, Matthew chapter 6, or sorry, 26 and verse 41. And uh, Jesus with his disciples here in the Garden of Gethsemane, and things are winding down for Jesus, and uh, he, he's, he knows he's facing, he's coming to the cross soon. And so he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples and gets a few of them, and he says, listen, come over here. He says, I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray with me. And <clears throat> so he goes away and prays, and then Jesus comes back, and he finds him sleeping, right? Probably because they're worn down and tired. But he says to them, he says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And, you know, it's the same with you and I in our life. It's like sometimes we have a willingness. We want to do something. We want to get somewhere. We, we, we may even want to do what God wants us to do. But we don't get there because we don't watch and we don't pray. And this is what happens. With, and, and when we don't do that, then we get separated from the source. You know, we get separated from the very thing that is going to feed us. It's going to make us strong for the moment that we're facing. So we need to watch and pray. Now, I'm going to turn this around and I'm going to say pray and watch because Paul rhymes with law. So I got to give you something that you can remember, right? So we need to pray and watch so that we can walk in the spirit so that we can live and walk. Okay? So remember that. Just use your paw to keep the law. Okay? Amen. But, you know, it's so important that we do that. It's that intimacy that God wants us to have with him even in those times when, when all those things are pressing against us so that we can overcome in these situations when the enemy's trying to take advantage of us. Um, so coming back again to Samson here, you know, he's obviously not doing that, right? He's, and we, don't, we don't see a lot of prayer in uh, Samson's life, but we do see one prayer that I want to look at specifically towards the end here. But... Um, but you know, Delilah does the same thing with him. She, she vexes him. She wears him down. She teases him to find out what the source of his strength is. And then eventually, after a period of time, you know, he tells her all of his heart, tells him that no one's ever cut my hair. No razor's ever touched my head. That was part of his Nazarite vow of him separating himself unto God. And, um, and then as a result of that, of course, Samson is taken captive um, because they cut his hair and he loses his strength. And um, the Philistines gouge out his eyes and they put him in prison. And, <clears throat> and then uh, at the end of that, in verse 28, he's, uh, he wants to seek revenge. And... At this, time, at this point, Samson's hair has started to grow back. And, and so, of course, you know, that part of that, his separation to the Lord comes. And so he cries out to the Lord because <clears throat> they want to make fun of Samson. They want him to come out and perform because, right, at this point, he's supposedly still weak. But he cries out to the Lord. And he says, oh, Lord, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, oh, God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And, of course, if you know the story, he pushes against the two main pillars that hold up this huge temple, and it all comes crashing down, and there's about 3,000 of the Philistines that are killed in that, and, of course, Samson dies with it, which I believe prematurely because he got into a place where uh, he wasn't supposed to be. But nonetheless, you know, God used him. God, 
God uh, heard his prayer and answered that prayer for the sake of setting the Israelites free from this oppression that they're under. And the problem with, you may have noticed there, is that when Samson cries out, he cries out and he says, Lord, grant me vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And part of the shortcoming with Samson here is it's all about him. Like he wants vengeance for himself. He's, he's not really thinking about the rest of the people for whom God raised him up to set them free and to help deliver them. But, it, but it's all about himself. And, and this is what Samson fell into in his whole life. And, you know, what do we learn from the life of Samson? I think this is one thing. This is one thing I learned and that I trust we see here is that Samson used all of his anointing that God gave him for ministry, but he didn't use any of it for his personal life. He didn't use any of it for the relationships that he was involved in. And, you know, we see that a lot even today. And, you know, we've all heard of lots of the uh, modern-day TV evangelists and stuff like that. And, and just, you know, God used them in a, in a powerful way. I mean, you, you, you can't – there's just certain things that happen, uh, maybe healings that happen through uh, different people, whatever, you know. But God uses them in a powerful way to see many people brought one to the Lord. Um, and then they get messed up in their personal lives. And that happens if we allow ourselves to just use our anointing, you know, the work of the Spirit in our lives for ministry and not in our own personal lives. You know, and, and I know for myself, like, I have to use it for my marriage. You know, I mean, Anita and I face different stresses and struggles. We're raising three boys and, and you know, just the things that come when, when you're doing things. And that's the same with you. Like, in your job, you, you face certain stresses or or different things, and you, you need to use the anointing of God, maybe in those relationships in your workplace. Maybe somebody's driving you crazy, you know? And, and we need to call on God for that. It's not just about the, the open public ministry, you know, that goes on. And so often, a lot of the work that gets accomplished in the open public ministry, um, a lot of that fruit can be lost because those people don't use their anointing for their personal, private lives in the relationships with people around them. So I think that's a huge thing that we learn from Samson's life. It, you know, when you, when you read the life of Samson, it, you know, it can seem kind of strange, right? Like, here's a guy who's mightily used of God in one sense, but in another sense, his, his life was just so messed up. And... And, you know, so did Samson, did he live and walk uh, in the spirit? Well, yes, in some areas of his life, I believe he did. And I think that's where we find him in Hebrews chapter 11 as being a great man of faith. Because when he faced the lion or when he faced all these Philistines coming at him, you know, he didn't turn around and run, right? I mean, there's lots of people that would have turned around and, and ran like crazy, but he didn't. He just stood up against them and, and fought off. And, and in, in one instance, he killed like a thousand men by himself all at once with the jawbone of a donkey. Like that was it. That's all he had for a weapon. You know, so incredible man of faith, right? But he didn't apply the anointing to the rest of his life. And I just want to look at that one where uh, in just kind of finishing up with Samson here in... Verse 19 of chapter 15. So I'm going to read chapter 18 too. Do you have 18, Brian? So after Samson has, has killed this, these thousand men, uh, it says, then he became very thirsty and he cried out to the Lord, and he said, You've given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? In verse 19. So God split the hollow ground that is in Lehi, and the water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he revived. And therefore, 
he called its name En Hakor, which is in Lehi to this day. You know, I read that years ago about how Samson here cried out to the Lord and the Lord split the walk, the rock and the water flowed out for him to drink from. But it also says at the end there, it says, it says, which is in Lehi to this day. So that meant for years afterwards, um, that water was still flowing for people to drink from. And I just think that's so true in your life and my life is that sometimes people come along uh, in life, you know, maybe some of these people that maybe just come to your mind when I'm talking about TV evangelists or whatever, people that have messed up. And, uh, but, you know, they, they, by faith, they have brought a flow of water through their lives. Even though some other things in their life were messed up, they brought a flow of water. And the Lord taught me, he said, he said Peter, like when you see that going on in other people's lives, don't reject the water. Don't reject the flow of water that's there for you to receive and to drink from. But you have to discern and reject the other part that's not a part of God's ways. You know, these other things that went on in Samson's life, they were not a part of, of the ways of God. They were not the way that God wanted him to walk. And so we don't look at something in in somebody else's life and say, well, that's sanctified, that's okay, because, I mean, look how God's using them. Like, look how God's using them mightily and powerfully. And it's like, no, God's, God's using them in those areas where they're, where they're walking by faith, where they're applying themselves, but over here where they're, where they're missing it, where they're not walking the way that they should be, um, that's something that you, we have to learn to discern. So, you know, you can receive those things. If, if maybe it's from a ministry and maybe there's things about that ministry, there's things that aren't right, there's things that aren't perfect, um, but you, God wants you to discern those things. You know, drink and receive those things that, that God is, is releasing through that ministry, but don't just take at face value that everything that they do is necessarily right. And so, again, that comes back to, you know, Jesus meeting you and I in our garden and saying, watch and pray, right? Watch and pray so that you can live and walk. Because if we don't stay connected to the source, then we're going to fall into things that God didn't want us to fall into. And we're going to miss, we're going to miss the, the fulfillment, really, the fullness of what God wanted us to walk into. Um, I think I'm going to just skip a couple things here, but, um, and that's because I put the clock back up. I knocked it down last week and somebody put it back up again. So. <laughs> um, but I just want to look at uh, just one last thing here, which is tying into this, which is, I, I just find it quite amazing. In, in Numbers chapter 24, there's a man called Balaam. And the Moabites come to him and they want him to curse the Israelites because the Israelites have been wiping out a few other nations because God's promised the, the land to them and they're evil and they're wicked like the Philistines, like we're finding out. And so they come to Balaam and they, they want to hire him to put a curse on the Israelites. And so... The whole story unfolds where Balaam says, well, I can only say what God wants me to say. And so he ends up actually blessing the Israelites. And then Balak, who's the head of the Moabites, he gets ticked off at, at Balaam and says, you know, I hired you to come and, and bless them. And it says in, in Deuteronomy, it says, where God, he turned the curse into a blessing. And it's really cool. It's, it's really, I find this really amazing. So God turned in this situation the curse into a blessing, and God will do that for you and me in our lives. There's a lot of stuff the enemy's doing behind the scenes, trying to pull you down, and demons are, are more real and happening around you and I than I think we give acknowledgement to. And I think that's one of the things that God is doing in his church and his body in these days, is making us more aware of those things, discerning those things, you know, so that we can stand against them. And 
So, so God turns the curse into a blessing. But then we find out in um, Numbers chapter 24 and verse 25. So Balaam arose and departed and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. And then verse 1 of 25. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Next verse there, Brian. And then in verse 9, you know, God ends up bringing this plague, and it says, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. And the incredible thing here is God turned the curse into a blessing for them. But what we see here is not everybody actually partook of that blessing. Because what happened was, and we find in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, the Lord is bringing a, a message to the church of, I believe it was the church of Pergamos here. And he's bringing this message to them, and he says, I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak. So, after he couldn't curse, after Balaam couldn't curse the Israelites, he taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So, what happened was, Balaam he taught this to Balak. And we find here, you know, like thousands of years later, now in the church, in the New Testament, there's this doctrine of Balaam going on, which I'm thinking, what? Like, what's, what's going on there, you know? Um, that this thing. And it's in part because, again, it's like, it's happening because Balaam and other people, they're not used, they, they use their anointing for ministry, but they don't use their anointing in their own personal lives. And so the church, even in, in Revelations here, um, the church, there's people in the church, because this isn't outside the church, this is to the church. There's people here who are falling into sexual immorality and they're, they're um, sacrificing to idols and that sort of thing. Because they're not, they're not staying close in their, in their relationship. They're not using their anointing to walk on in their relationship with the Lord. They're getting separated from their source, right? So again, we have to use, you know, that, our paw, you know, we have to pray and watch or watch and pray in order to live and walk. And... So often we find here, you know, just like with, you know, the time of Balaam and and when God turned the curse into a blessing. And so, you know, God's, as we know, he's he's taken them out of Egypt. He took Israel out of Egypt, but now he's at work to take Egypt out of them. And that's the same with you and me. It's like as we're learning to live and to walk, you know, God's at work to take Egypt out out of you and me. He's delivered us. He set us free from things. But now he's, he's working to take Egypt out of us. You know, and the only way that you and I are going to go on and fulfill what God has for you. And he has a, a specific plan for each one of us you know, to fill and, and to walk in. But the only way you're going to do that is if you stay intimate with God. You're watching and praying so that you can live and walk, because God doesn't just want you to live, he wants you to walk, he wants you to walk out what he has for you, amen brother?